Thank you. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about self-driving technology, but uh, before I do that, I, I've got to share some bad news with you today. Um, 35. 35, uh, that's the number of people that are going to die worldwide in automobile accidents just while I'm speaking. 35 people during my talk, 35 people died during the previous talk, 35 more will probably die before you even get out of the building. It's not just a worldwide problem, it's a problem here in the U.S., so one person in the U.S. on average will die during the period of uh, the, the time that I'm giving this talk. And it's an interesting, bizarre concept, right? Because if you look at this, if you do the math, if these statistics hold up, five people in this room are ultimately going to die in a car crash. It seems crazy, and it's a unique part of our humanity, because if you look at the causes of death, the top ten causes of death, they're all diseases that have been around forever. And then there's this strange category, the fourth one on the list, called accidents. And there's three of them. One is accidental fall, <laughs> another accidental poisoning, and the third one is automobile accident. So here's this strange thing of all the ways to die. There, there's only one that's something we created for ourselves just in the last hundred years, and yet we go out and do this every day for some reason. Automobiles are unique in that way. Now you might think, okay, well, yeah, okay, things are, but things are getting better. Um, and I think uh, what's interesting is the statistics are out. Uh, 2015 uh, was the deadliest year in quite a while. There, it's actually getting worse. And the preliminary numbers for 2016 say it's another 6% worse over 2015. So this problem doesn't seem to be going away. And so in fact, uh, the National Highway and Transportation Safety um, uh, Administration did a study to figure out, okay, what's going on? What is the defective component in automobiles? And they found the defective component. Uh, it turns out it's the driver. 94% of the time, it's the driver's fault that that accident happened. They did some more studies, and they said, well, okay, what's, what's the driver doing wrong? Well, the biggest cause is what they politely call recognition error. What that really means is you weren't paying attention and you missed something that was very important. The second biggest category is what they call decision error. That's a polite way to say you were driving too fast for the con conditions, or you did something illegal, uh, or you just failed to figure out where the other people in your environment were going to move, and that's how you had an accident. So what are we going to do about this? Um, well, I have an idea. What I'm going to do is buy a whole bunch of that, you know that yellow police tape? You can buy it in really big rolls. We're going to go to all the cars and just wrap it around the driver's seat and the steering wheel. And this is going to save us a whole bunch of trouble because now there won't be any more of these accidents. Of course, that's not the whole story, right? Because for some reason we still like these cars and apparently it's because we want to use them to get around. So the only way we're really going to make any progress is if we figure out how to have that car drive itself. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Now there's some pretty cool things that happen. So here's a self-driving car. There's some pretty cool things that are changing. When you own a car yourself that you're going to drive, it's got to look good. <laughs> You've got to be cool when you're driving around in your car, right? If you're not going to own a car, and it, you're not even going to drive it, it's just going to come by and pick you up, your priorities change a little bit. The, mo the things that are most important are that this car be safe and efficient. And so what that means is you get something that looks like this vehicle here, this self-driving car, the most visible difference uh, is the sensors on the top. So it's got cameras with 360 degree view around the top of the car. It's also got a laser rangefinder called a LIDAR that's on top of the car, also 360 degree view. And it's got radars all the way around it, 360 degree view. And so this changes how driving happens. When a human's driving home from work and they get to a residential street, what are they doing? They're worried about all the stress at work. They're worried about what errands they were supposed to do uh, before they got home. Or even worst case, they're texting friends to go see where they're going to meet up later. 
And what happens? They can hit a child or someone else appearing somewhere that they didn't realize they were going to appear. But how does this self-driving car work? It's got multiple kinds of sensors with 360 degree coverage. It is watching every car, every gap, every street, every time, all day long. It's completely covered the recognition problem or the paying attention problem. And that's the one benefit of it. Now the second one comes in what's hidden, uh, in the case of this car, what's hidden in the back uh, is a lot of computation. Right? And so that's the other thing that's made this possible is all the advances uh, with all that sensor data, all the computation available, and most importantly, the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm that make it possible for this car to make smart decisions. And so what I want to do now is talk to you a little bit about the artificial intelligence behind it. But first, I want to describe the problem to you. And so I'm going to show you, this is a video that's very normal. We all experience this video all the time. In fact, I might even call it boring. But many uh, people in this audience know how to co program a computer. So now sit down and envision you're the one sitting at the keyboard. You've got to program the system that's going to have this car figure out what to do. It's terrifying. There are cars moving in all directions all the time. Some of them signal, some of them don't. There are pedestrians and bikes doing the same thing, going in random different directions. Luckily, there's crosswalks for the pedestrians, but don't worry about that because half of them ignore it and just walk somewhere else anyway. <laughs> there are stop signs, which you should pay attention to. There are other signs that say stop smoking. Don't worry about those. Well, you should worry about those. The self-driving car doesn't need to worry about those. There are flashing lights. Some of them matter. Some of them are just businesses trying to get your attention. There's all these cute, cool patterns in the sky, like those clouds moving around. OK, you shouldn't get distracted by them. Well, un unless, of course, they turn really dark, then maybe you should pay attention to them. So this is a really hard AI problem to solve. And how I'm going to explain the, how we go about solving this is I'm actually going to take a step backwards. Uh, and just talk through some of the evolution of self-driving vehicles and sort of the intelligence they gained as we went. Of course, we're all lucky to be at CMU here, which is one of the centers uh, of self-driving work. And so we can look at this through a little bit of our history here. And so to go all the way back to the 80s, what we, what we find there is that we have something called NavLab, which is this giant van. And of course, it has to be a giant van because it needs that much space and that much power and that much cooling to just barely house enough computers to maybe do something smart. And so this particular van did all right. It could drive on that road you see it driving on. But this was a certain era of robotics where I would tell everyone the mantra was, keep the video running at all times just in case it works and something good happens. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so. The NavLab program continued throughout the 80s, um, and it reached a point where perhaps a milestone was in 95 was the No Hands Across America drive. So this was a drive from Pittsburgh to LA in an autonomous vehicle. It's kind of cool to think about, man, that was over 20 years ago that was done here. And so that vehicle drove over 98% of the way autonomously and had a 70 mile stretch with no human intervention. For those of you that are fans of deep learning or know what that was, deep learning goes in waves. It, it becomes trendy and not trendy. The previous wave uh, was when this hit, and it was called multi-layer perceptrons then, rather than deep learning. But it's interesting to think about the AI for this vehicle. What was this, what was this AI agent's world like? It's, it didn't know where it was. It didn't know where it was going. All it knew was there were these two lines on its image in front of it. And what it should do is try to keep those lines in the middle of the image. And from an AI perspective, that's the only thing it knew. And still, it was able to drive across the country. Now, if we scroll ahead here, uh, the next thing is there was work in off-road research. And the cool advance here is, A, this vehicle knows where it is and where it's going, at least in a GPS sense. Uh, so it's got some idea of that. And it's also added the LIDAR so it can sense the world around it. It actually has an a sense of objects, although they're all treated as static, so they're all just obstacles, but it knows how to plan a path. And this already is able to get it enough um, uh, capability to drive in some pretty complex environments. So in many ways, a, a, a nice milestone was, the, was in 2007, the DARPA Urban Challenge, 
right? So this was the contest DARPA, DARPA put out for self-driving cars to drive in a mock-up city. And they added a couple important things. They added a good map. Here a map means a 3D reconstruction of everything in the world that it expects to drive in. So it knows exactly where it is, and it knows exactly what it needs to do in this world given everything around it. The other thing it does is it now has enough intelligence to reason about the other objects. It can say which ones are the vehicles, and it can try to predict which way they're going to go so that it can make smarter decisions. Uh, and of course, we're at CMU, so we can say, and CMU won the contest, which is also great. Another cool thing that happened at this time was that Google decided, hey, this tech's getting there. And this is when the Google Car Project started using exactly this strategy for, for making self-driving cars. Of course, CMU also saw opportunity in this, and they started working with companies about making mining trucks. And this is cool because these were among the first commercially available autonomous vehicle systems, and the motivation was primarily safety and preventing uh, mistakes of the operators. The trucks are very valuable, so you can certainly pay someone to drive that truck, but what you can't afford is all the mistakes they'll make when they drive it. And so this was pretty cool. So after this period of time, this was really something viable. So not long after this, Uber started its work in self-driving vehicles, as well as many of the automakers, as well as many of the other tech companies. And so now we can ask ourselves, all right, there's safety, but what, what else? What else is self-driving technology going to change? And I think there's a, there's a lot of things. One of them is our time. So here's a study that was done, again, by the US government. Uh, and it found that the average American was losing 42 hours a day in traffic jams. Uh, this, of course, has a corresponding large amount of uh, uh, expense financially um, and frustration. And so the point of this study was to say, OK, what, uh, what can we do about congestion? But from the point of view of someone who's thinking about having a self-driving car that they're not going to have to own and they're not going to have to drive, the loss is much bigger. We spend 293 hours a year in a car, and all of it is wasted time. That's, seven, that's over seven weeks of working time that we could have back. So we could ask ourselves, what would we do with all that time if we had it back? If we listened to the earlier talk, we might procrastinate it all away. But I'm a little more optimistic than that. I think we're going to find good things to do with all that extra time. But we can ask ourselves another question. Most of the people in the audience here own a car. What's your car doing right now? Probably the same thing as mine, nothing. And so it turns out <laughs> we're not the only bad guys. There's a billion cars in the world, and 96% of the time they're doing nothing. What that means is that up to 20% of the land in some cities is just dedicated to parking. For all the people in this room, it's estimated that the number of parking spots just to keep our cars occupied uh, is a good chunk of the size of the CMU campus. That is a lot of space we could have back. And so I think what we're going to change is not only ourselves and our cars, we're going to change the city. We have less need for parking infrastructure. We have opportunities to do other things with it. And so when I look at that row of parked cars right there, I don't know if it's me, I'm thinking bike lane. That would be cool. But maybe we're going to invent some other things. Maybe we're going to invent the concept of uh, dog walking lanes, and we're going to have them everywhere. Or maybe this is going to be the K-pop dancing lane. Or how about a special place just for bottle flipping? I think there's so much we could do with this. And I think it's going to change not only the space itself, but the public transit infrastructure. As we know, public transit's a very valuable thing. It's valuable for all the people in a city. But often, it's not very efficient, and many cities struggle to make it financially viable. Once we have cars that drive themselves, we have a real opportunity uh, to reinvent the public transit systems in our cities. And so, so far, I've talked mainly about moving people. But in fact, it's important to move things, too. We spend a lot of money on that. And by making the, the movement of things more efficient, it will become cheaper, all of our goods will become cheaper, 
all of our supply chains. Imagine you're putting your supply chain together and suddenly shipping is automatic and cheap and efficient. It's going to completely change how your company operates. Um, and so what I want to do, uh, I'm going to wrap up here. But the comment I want to make is that this sole dream I've been telling you, people have been telling this story for decades, pretty much since cars were invented, that someday these things are going to drive, drive themselves. But what's changed is now the artificial intelligence and machine learning is here. We can do this, and it's happening right now. You can take rides in that vehicle I showed you right here in Pittsburgh. You can take rides in Phoenix. You'll see self-driving cars in California and Michigan and other countries around the world. So for sure, the work's not done. There's more to do, and we need more help. But this is happening right now. And so what that means is I'm going to finish with a challenge to all of us. We are on the verge of a once-in-a-generation, maybe once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reinvent our lives, our city, and how all of our time and money is spent. And so the challenge is for us to figure out what, what are we going to do with all these resources that are freed up by self-driving cars. Thank you.